Hello and welcome back to Adventure All The Way. I'm Emma and I'm a homeschooling mum of three in the UK. So today I want to talk about homeschooling preschoolers. I've had quite a few DMs about this. Um, first off, I want to say that a preschooler in our house is when you are from two to about the age of seven. Now, the, 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 the beginning age is always the same um, and I'm talking about like older two, two and a half kind of age, not just turn two today kind of age. Um, and six or seven is kind of the where it ends depending on the emotional age of a child. Um, now one of my children started about six, the other one started about seven and I reckon my third, my youngest will probably start around six as well. Um, with my children, who two of whom are autistic and one who's probably autistic, um, their emotional age doesn't correspond with their chronological age, so they need a bit more time to kind of mature before they're ready for that kind of sit down, um, that sit down work and really being able to sit and pay attention. So, Bessie, who is almost seven, has just started this September, her reception level work, so she's just come out of preschool. So the main focuses of our home educating preschool, and this is very um, topical for me at the moment because Albert's actually just been pulled out of um, an actual preschool. Um, so this is kind of really, really in the forefront of my mind at the moment is how I can encourage, <coughs> encourage learning with him um but through play the most important focuses for me are reading readiness maths readiness life skills and learning about the world around them as well as art and then social emotional and communicational skills which kind of all comes under life skills as well um the most important focus though of everything is play Play is so important for everybody, not just young children or older children or teenagers or anything like that. It's really important for everybody. Now, you might play by playing a board game or playing cards or by tickling or playing chase or hide and seek or whatever with your children or with your family or friends or whatever. But the idea is that we learn as humans, we learn best through play, no matter what age we are. And play is a foundation for everything, especially for young children. It's the foundation for literacy, it's foundation for maths, foundation for science. Playing with sand and water at a sand and water table is science. And But all of that is play. It's beginning to learn about what solids and liquids are and all of that kind of thing. You know, lining, doing jigsaw puzzles, this beginning of maths readiness and so on. And everything begins with play. Now, lots of people ask me, why don't you do school until they're six or seven? Like, they start at four to four to five in the UK. Yes, they do, but we are one of the youngest starters in, the, in Europe, and potentially even in the world. I think there's a few countries that start at three, but not many. Um, there's more countries that start at six or seven than there are that start younger and those countries specifically Finland which is what we have modeled are a lot of our education philosophy on um don't start until the year the child turns seven so for example Bessie would just be starting kindergarten in Finland now um if we were there and she was going to school um and which is what she's doing at home with us the children who start later they have the same or better outcomes as children who start earlier. Um, learning to read at an older age means that they have more time for just play and lots of other life skills that are really important when they're little. Get them up to a good level and then the reading just comes and also you've got all of that time to really get to know the alphabet, the letter sounds and by the time that they are seven and they're ready to go they just start reading like that. That was certainly the case for Charles, who is almost nine, and my eldest, and Bessie, she's getting there. She's a very reluctant reader though, we're not sure if there's another special need going on with her when it comes to reading, but right now it's just very gentle, easing her in to reading and, and making sure that reading readiness is really up to point. So, 
what type of activities do we do now a lot of people say to me well how do you homeschool a preschooler obviously you're not really doing anything especially if you're following my philosophy you're not really doing very much in the way of formal education or any um i won't sit down with albert who's almost four and get him to do anything he's not emotionally there yet um he has the motor skills but he's not there emotionally so um, so the first area that we're going to talk about is, as I said, reading readiness, which also kind of encompasses writing readiness, maths readiness, the world around us, art, motor skills, gross motor skills, so moving your body, and fine motor skills, moving your fingers, um, and then social, emotional, and communicational. And I've got some examples of the activities that I do for each one and I'm going to talk a little bit about them and um, I will post more on this um, like on my blog on my website or if you want to chat to me about it and I can kind of show you some resources I use then that's fine too so reading readiness it's really really simple none of these things need a lot of planning and if you're the kind of person who likes to do a lot of planning then that's great go for it plan to your heart content but you do have to be aware that it may all go bottoms up. I was going to say something else then, but your kids might be listening, so I won't. <laughs> so read to them every single day, without fail. I, if it's only a bedtime story, sorry, my tummy gurgled then. It does, if it's only a bedtime story, that's fine. I try and aim for five books a day, and if I don't get them done during the day, we try and have a story time during the day in the afternoon, when everyone's a bit tired and grumpy, we all sit down and we have story time. Um... If we haven't got if we haven't got story time done then i will read lots of books at bedtime instead and we try and talk about the story as well i'll ask them questions um oh what did you think uh, we, we, one of albert's favorite books at the moment is dear zoo oh you know if the zoo was going to send you a pet what do you think they would send you and would you send it back you know would it be too tall too heavy too grumpy and and so on um then um, we also will try and make up our own stories based on stories that we love. So instead of Stick Man, we've had Pooh Man, we've had Leaf Man, um, Dog Man. You, you get the point. Sometimes they get really, really funny. Pooh and Wee, Pooh, Mr. Pooh and Mrs. Wee, and oh, always bodily fluids. Um, <coughs> um, but it seems to really really want them to you know like let's do more let's do more and and then they never want to stop um the other thing with this kind of reading readiness but also writing readiness um is allowing them to use pens and crayons and free use of that they know they can get paper whenever they like we have drawers that has that have pens and crayons <laughs> try again shall i with pencils and crayons i'm not even going to edit that out you're just going to see me go blah, 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 like tazzy devil um, and pens and pencils, crayons and stuff like that that they can just freely use. Um, again, I've talked about this with Reggio. I feel like that they should be able to um, freely use, you know, have creative expression freely. It should be a, um, you know, they should be able to do whatever they like. Um, they also, I'll also get them using scissors, child safe scissors, so they might be doing this action on them, and then when they're a bit older they'll then do the scissor action. Um, and also tweezers, not like, you know, beauty tweezers, but they do these big plastic tweezers that you have to hold like this. This kind of action is really good at training all the muscles in the hand. Um, another thing of reading readiness, again, that we do is nursery rhymes and poems, and that might be child aim, aim, poems aimed at children, but it also might be poems aimed at all ages. Um, I just feel like the more they're exposed to battery change, I knew it wouldn't last long. Um, so the nursery rhymes, the poems, um, the more they're exposed to literature of any kind, the more they seem to fall in love with literature. Um, and again, that's something that's advised is exposing them to printed word as much as possible. Um, we try and keep a little basket that has a nursery rhyme book in, um, also we have a nursery rhyme CD that we use and then a little a little box will have say five or six selections of books and we'll try and use those repeatedly for a couple of months and to be fair that happens reasonably organically a lot of children Albert especially really like certain books like at the moment we've got Dear Zoo um, Never Never um, 
Invited Dinosaur to Dinner, I think it's called. It's one of my favourite books to read to them at bedtime. Um, and there's a couple of others that, that Albert really likes to read. Um, we try and encourage them to read the same amount, the, the same books, because the repetition is really good for them to learn. And the same with Nursery Rhymes, there'll be five or six that we try and, you know, listen to a lot for, say, a month or six weeks or whatever. Same with the poems, just to get that memorising in their head and really get used to and memorise the poems, nursery rhymes, etc. It really helps them learn it. Dear Zoo, I think Albert could probably just by opening the page, he could probably tell you what it says because he's been he's been it's been read to him so many times. Maths readiness is the next one. Um, again, this is really simple. None of this is rocket science. Um, the next one is so with using mathematical language in everyday life. It could be something. Excuse me? Lily? You are a dog. Get down. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> my dog's finished being naughty. Um, using mathematical language in everyday life. Really, really simple. More than, less than. Um, oh, there's four sweets and two of us. How will we divide them between the two of us? And so on. Um, just using those kind of making a list of the mathematical language that you want them to learn. Add, divide, take away, subtract, divide, multiply, whatever you want to call it. Whatever you want to, you know, assign those names. Um, more than, less than. Positional language. Above, below, in front of, behind, left, right. Um ordinal numbers first second third fourth fifth and so on using that language um counting things out as you go um oh how many lampposts do we go by when we're on our walk to the park one two three and so on um just bringing that you can start that when they're really really little um, we've done all these things with albert and the other day i realized that he actually knows all his numbers one to ten and he can put them all in um in the right order if you give them all flashcards and I was like what and it's just because he's you know he's watched a few different preschool shows he's done some things with me where we've looked at books which is what I'm coming to next um with ones and you know the numbers in and he's just absorbed that information and now has learnt it which brings me to my next point counting songs and books things like six dinner sid are really good because in a book like six dinner sid you know you've got one two three four five six houses there's lots of opportunities to count to six and so on there's lots of books like that you can find them i think there's books um something like and uh, we had we had 10 little dinosaurs or something like that again that's really really good Counting songs, simple ones like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, once I caught a fish alive, that sort of thing. There's lots of songs that have counting in and they're going to teach your child to count, um, just to have that language in their head. And then they can actually, when you start to progress more into mathematics, you can kind of really pinpoint one, two, three, four, five. The other thing I love to do for maths readiness, which is also kind of scientific as well, and has a bit of reading readiness in, is baking. Um, you can get the old fashioned weighing scales that, you know, go like this, and really, you know, get them to, get them to put all the weights on, the weights on, and measure out the ingredients, that's always really fun. And then you've also, if you have digital scales like we do, you can be like, oh, we need 200, it says 210, we need less. Can you take away less? Can you subtract some flour from the bowl and put it back in the packet? And so on. Um, and it's just, it's really, really fun as well. They don't know that they're doing something that is deemed as mathematics in our heads. And um, they have a great time. And you get to eat cake or biscuits or whatever you have. So the next category is the world around us. Um, this is very literal. Um, and it, uh, for the world around us we do things like nature walks and we do lots of talking while we're on a nature walk looking for different things um i give them nature hunts to do which you can find on twinkle i've included a link in the description um we also follow the exploring with ch exploring nature with children um curriculum loosely in the sense that on our nature walk on a friday um 
when it's seed week we'll look for seeds when it's mini beast week we'll look for mini beasts we don't tend to actually do all of the stuff that is there to offer because my children just aren't interested it just gives us a focus for the week and then we kind of have organic learning come up within that you know talking about things drawing pictures and so on um, but children can, little children can really um, gain a lot from doing the exploring with nature with children. Again, I've put a link in the description. Um, the other things we do is getting them really immersed in cultural festivals. Now, our specific cultural festivals I've talked about a little bit. Um, we do celebrate the festivals of the Wheel of the Year. We've just had Maybon. And we'll talk about other cultural festivals um throughout the year we won't do say you know learn about all the jewish festivals or all the muslim festivals or all the hindu festivals or anything like that we'll just kind of pick a, a couple maybe that ones that just pop up on my calendar or on google i'll go oh it's the festival of blah today and um, we'll do a little bit of research in that um but we mainly focus on our own cultural festivals especially with um younger children and we'll really immerse them in the pre the preparations um for the festival so obviously you saw our maybon video where i'm talking um about the different activities for the autumn equinox and i'm um, sorry i was just watching my cat and my dog have this really weird interaction got distracted so easily i'm so sorry um and we'll do all of those activities really getting them into thinking about autumn and the equinox and what that means for us um Samhain is approaching which is the same day as Halloween we do a lot of talk about our ancestors around Halloween and things like that and, and so on another idea that we do um for the world around us is role play of key roles in society um sometimes this might be paramedics or vets or nurses <sighs> shops you name it and especially in these coronavirus times really learning who our key workers are is really really important my husband works in funeral care so that there, and there's always a lot of role playing about doing daddy's job which people who <laughs> don't know our family very well and don't know that that is philip's job can get a little bit confused and maybe freaked out would be the word when our children are pretending to be undertakers essentially and oh no this dolly died we'll have to dress it and put it in this box and dig a hole and put it in the ground um and people are like what on earth are they playing I'm like they're just being daddy and also people who are in the funeral service are key workers so it is an important job um we uh, we do lots of uh, role play about that and sometimes it is we don't dress up we're not always dressing up as nurses or vets or whatever sometimes it's just playing that or playing it with dolls or whatever um i will always let this happen organically i don't force it i'm not like right today children we're going to be we're going barbie and ken are going to be a doctor and a nurse of course barbie would be the doctor um and then we'll also do trips out to our local area we haven't really done this this year because of covid um but usually we would go to our local wildlife park we'd go to our local farm we would go to um, local museums and things like that. We're not really, um, I would be quite happy to go to these places as long as we were washing our hands and using hand gel and wearing masks and stuff. Um, actually, it's the children who are very anti going to them. Um, they've actually got very used to not going to these places um, because of their autism. It's really hard to kind of get them out of that. We are slowly going more places. Um, but they are very anxious about going to places where they might encounter people. Um, we're slowly getting there. And hopefully um, when we start to come out of this, hopefully next year, that they will be less worried about going places. Because I'll be able to say to them, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. Um, I'm not sure I will be able to do that, but we'll see. The other thing is learning about animals and, and plants. Um, this is really simple you can just grow a sunflower where you can grow cress or beans or whatever you like um but if you could if you do it in a say like a a, a soda or fizzy fizzy drink bottle cut it in half and then you can plant the seed really close to the edge and then the children can see the roots going down see the shoot coming up and it's really fascinating um and we've done that with lots of different types of plants animals if you have pets getting them really involved in the pet care and learning about the animal 
why why it's important to care for them the way you do and their body language or things like this it's nothing that you have to sit down and label parts of a dog or something like that you could just talk about this is like my dog lily as you see her regularly pop into different videos this is her paw this is her head this is her tail can you find her tummy can you find her foot can you find her her paw pads can you find her teeth her tail and so on it's all learning about animals and it's all learning about the world around us we are very spoilt that we live near a lot of woodland, um, we live near the new forest, as I've said a thousand times, um, so we have a lot of wildlife that we can spot. There's, um, we're also look, always looking for cows, there's um, some highland cattle that are out in the forest that are absolutely beautiful, um, but now we're on the lookout for pigs for the next couple of months and it's really exciting, like, have you seen a pig yet? And every time we people we ask people here in the forest, have you seen a pig yet? No, I haven't seen any pigs yet. And then when we do see a pig, we're like, ah! pig <laughs> and it's really exciting to Albert what noise does a pig make <sniffs> and so on and you can do all these things with the horses and the cattle that we live nearby and we also then talk wildlife that we see or that we might see oh there's a big hole underneath that tree I wonder who lives there it might be about Mr Badger or whatever and we just draw pictures of these animals and we look at books about the animals and so on Moving on to the next category, we've got art. Now, this is, again, self-explanatory. We try and give them things that are gonna help with other areas of learning as well. So I'll do drawing and I'll encourage them to use a pincer, a, you know, the tripod grip, rather than a fist grip and so on. Um, we'll also use finger painting. Now, some, two of my children have always been happy to get their hand right stuck into the paint and get covered in paint and do all sorts of finger painting and things. Um, Albert is a little bit more fussy with what goes on his hands so we might use a sponge stamp or um, a roller because he has to hold it like this um, or even just making stamps out of potatoes or apples or whatever um, he still has to get some paint on his hands so it's helping with sensory um, sensory kind of what's the word I'm looking for desensitization I suppose but it's also um, encouraging him to use that kind of he's using like this so instead of maybe going like this with his fingers he's get, making fists like this as he grips hold of something that's really good for the hands which also helps towards writing readiness as I've said before it all ties in um, another thing we like to do is collages I'll give them magazines newspapers tissue paper I'll print pictures off for them, we'll cut them up into pieces, I'll get the children to cut them up into pieces actually, and then they can use glue, maybe a glue spreader with PVA glue or a print stick, because again they're holding it like this, and then they make a collage, they're having to pick up the individual pieces like this, again more fine motor skills. So, where's my list, there we go, moving on, the next category is motor skills, Gross motor skills, the things that I'm, these will be specific to your child, but the ones that I'm working on with Albert at the moment are throwing and catching, riding his balance bike, and once Christmas or Yule for us comes around, he will have a scooter, which we're so excited to give him. Um, balancing on one foot and then the other foot. Um, hopping, skipping, jumping, dancing, all of these different things. Um, I'm also encouraging him to do exercises like yoga, but also exercises that encourage him to cross the midline. And that is literally, if you imagine that there's a line going right down your body and your arms are crossing the midline like this. There might be stretches like this, or they might be throwing things over your shoulder, that sort of thing. Um, I do have two books that I use for gross and fine motor skills. I've linked them in the description and if you want to buy them yourselves and have a look through you can. If you're interested in having a look at them I'm happy to do a video where I review them. Um, just let me know. Fine motor skills, again these are really fun. Threading, it could be threading um, some yarn through pasta. Doesn't have to, you don't have to go out and buy a threading kit, you can do this all really easily and cheaply. Ribbon is another good one, you can thread that through pasta. Tweezers, as I mentioned earlier, you can get these big plastic ones on Amazon, I've linked them in the description again, where you have to hold them like this and you can pick up buttons, pick up bits of fruit, you can use them like chopsticks or something and eat with them, like anything like that to encourage that, that action and train up those hands ready for writing. Uh, the other things we like to do are like rice and oat and glitter pictures and pasta crafts, anything like that, you know, the whole macaroni picture frame type things. They're really, really good for fine motor skills. 
I hope you guys have got a cup of tea as well. This is a long one, isn't it? Oh. So the final category is social, emotional, communicational. The communication, it runs through all of the other categories, I find. The more you talk to your child about what they're doing, the more they're going to learn to communicate with you and vice versa. Um, and the other thing with the communication is, again, as I said, reiterated earlier, the stories, nursery rhymes um, and poems, things like that, and making them using the same ones over and over again for a certain amount of time before you change them, just to get that consistency, the memorizing, all of that sort of thing. Also the asking questions, as I said earlier, that's really important about everything. Ask them questions all the time. Um, but the social and emotional. Now, obviously right now, social education is really difficult because we can't meet in big groups. We can only see one person. Um, so um, it's all very difficult to be social at the moment, but the kids obviously do extracurricular activities. Um, Albert doesn't really have anything like that at the moment. And we were starting to think about um, doing play dates specifically with people who had children of his age um, before the coronavirus came about so that's been put, put by for now and when we're allowed to meet safely with people who have children who are his age we're going to do that and um, the emotional education is really really important to me um, I talked a lot about this in um when i filmed it earlier and actually made the video almost an hour long so i'm going to try and keep it um a little bit shorter this time so the emotional education for me is really really important and it ties in with my parent how philip and i raise our children um as i i may have said before i'm not sure if i've said it in another video before we try and practice something called pace which is a type of therapeutic parenting it's aimed at children who are neurodiverse and or who have experienced trauma and PACE stands for playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy um, and it's all those words kind of govern how you approach a situation and I try and in, I try and model that behaviour with them so then they model it with with other children. It certainly has worked for my children, um, my older children will use the techniques that I use with them on other children or their friends um, they'll use it on their little brother especially the big two they will use it on their little brother Charles my eldest will use it on both of the, his younger siblings and it's really really nice to see him respond to and Bessie my daughter to respond to them to respond to each other in this really positive gentle therapeutic and just generally empathetic way. The other thing we try and encourage from a very early age is turn taking, and this is something that our kids really struggle with, is waiting and turn taking. We do use a sand timer, it's around here somewhere, um, to encourage turn taking. The one child, something actually we, we learned from preschool when Albert was there, one child will take the sand timer and say, when the sand time is finished I would like to play with that or I would like to have my toy back and then the other child must is given a bit more time to play with it and then is asked to give it back give it back or it's usually in our house it's, it's given back so say Albert's playing with something that belongs to Charles Charles says I'm happy for you to continue playing with it which is a really big deal because he hates people playing with his things um but when the sand time is finished I would like it back Albert responds really, really well to this, and Charles and Albert kind of have an understanding, it's, and, it, and it happens the other way around as well. Bessie hates the timer, she hates sharing her things, she doesn't like giving up her stuff, um, but she's quite happy, and she won't use it if um, she wants something back either. Um, she really, really struggles with that, so we're keeping on that turn taking. Um, the other thing we try to do with them is non-violent communication. This is really important, and I'm not saying that every other kind of communication is violent, but when you think about non-violent communication and the reasons behind it, it kind of does feel that way occasionally. Non-violent communication is all about expressing your feelings and how you feel about a situation, about something that's happened, without assigning blame, and without being verbally aggressive in any way. Um, it's to take into account the feelings of the person that you have conflict with as well as your own and not to make the situation worse um, we try and encourage the children to use this on other people as well as each other and on the whole it does really work um, and it really means there's a quite peaceful atmosphere in our house 
nearly all of the time and as a Libra I really love the peace um, <laughs> I live with a two Capricorns, an Aquarius and a Pisces so you know it's, it's a bit <laughs> um, we, we have a really really peaceful household and when there's other people in our lives who don't practice um, non-violent communication who don't practice pace or really are so far away from that it's really kind of feels like an attack when people have expressed conflict because we're so used to doing it in such a non-assigning blame peaceful playful curious empathetic and accepting way um to use the acronym um that when people come to us and they have a problem and they're and they're very aggressive and their voice is actually really quite upsetting for all of us um depending on whoever they're talking to and really when especially my children obviously i can't speak for anyone else's especially i can't speak for other autistic children but my children they really really need this style of um care to make them thrive and when they don't have pace and when they're not spoken to with non-violent communication when they're disciplined they really really struggle to process that and it usually ends up in a meltdown that's basically how what we do with our homeschooling and um, preschoolers um, it's really really important for us that we cover all of those things and none of it is really planned out i won't sit and plan things i may um get albert to join in on the overall projects and things like that but i don't force him he's usually quite happy just going off playing by himself anyway so that is all for today's video you may get a bit of a treat in that you may get a couple of videos this week um as i've said before it is my birthday this week i am 30 on wednesday and i'm going to be filming while we are away at chessington world of adventures in um in the uk we're really excited to go i haven't been since i was a child um the children are excited phil doesn't remember ever going so he doesn't think he has so we're really really excited um to go there as a family they have a theme park and they have a zoo um, I've been linked again I've linked their website in the description if you're interested in seeing what we're going to be getting up to um, including things like our birthday cake by an amazing local baker and all of the other fun things that we're going to get up to um, on Wednesday and Thursday so I will see you then I will be not in my 20s when we see each other next <laughs> Have a great week guys and remember that you have got this and you are smashing it. Bye.